I was standing on the banks of the river, looking out over life's troubled sea, when I saw an old ship that was sailing. Is that the Ship of Zion, I see its hull was bent and battered from the storms of life. I could see waves were rough, but that old ship. Steady. Is that the old ship of Zion I see? At the stern of the ship was the captain. I could hear as he called out my name. It's the old ship of Zion. It will never pass this way again. As I step on board, I'll be leaving all my troubles and trials. Sailing out on the old ship of Zion. How beautiful heaven must be, must be. Sweet hope of the happy and free.
Ephesians chapter 1. Let's look at verse 3. Though there's not a period in verse 3, I think we'll just read the one verse. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. I want to call your attention tonight to verse number 3 or the middle portion of that verse where he said, Who hath blessed us? Who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places? I want to preach tonight on we are blessed. We are blessed. Had the service not taken the turn that it did and during the song service, and then uh, my heart come up in my throat, I felt maybe that the Lord would have us to sing that song we just sang. I was going to request that Danny sing the song, I Am Blessed, before I preach tonight. Because truly, we are blessed. Regardless of the uh, heartaches, and I'll turn myself on now, buddy. I know you're waiting on me. I'll come to myself in a few moments. I get excited when I do things I'm not used to. But... Uh, we are blessed regardless of the burdens that we may feel that we carry sometimes, regardless of the heartaches and the problems that come our way, we're still blessed to know the Lord. I want to give you tonight, in the, in the next few minutes, four or five things that describe how we're blessed, some things that the Lord has blessed us with. Truly, we are blessed. I want to say first of all tonight that we're blessed with a pardon that cannot be discredited. The Bible teaches us that the devil is the accuser of the brethren. But I'm glad tonight when a person comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, he receives pardon for his sin, and he is born into the family of God, the devil and all of his demons cannot discredit what takes place in the man's heart and life when he's saved. I am blessed tonight with a pardon that cannot be discredited. The devil cannot discredit what God did for me. When I was, a, when I was 11 year old boy and I came to the Lord Jesus, I was saved, I was pardoned and forgiven of my sin and the devil and all of his cohorts can't do anything to discredit that. You see, the devil comes sometimes and he wants to throw up our past. He goes to the Lord. If he were to go to the Lord tonight and, and accuse me and, and to throw up my past to the Lord, the Lord would say, what past? I don't see anything uh, on uh, his record. But as far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed his iniquities from him. See, the devil has no accusation to make of the past because the past is under the blood. The past has been wiped clean. The past has been washed away in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have been blessed with a pardon tonight. The devil cannot discredit. Oh, you say, that's the past, but what about the present? He comes to us in the present, and he is going to accuse me before the Heavenly Father and uh, the devil goes and he presents his case and the father looks over at me and the only thing he sees is Jesus. <laughs> Can you get a hold of that? I mean, when, uh, he looks at, when he looks at me, he does not see me, but he sees Jesus. That's what is described to us in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 when the Bible talks about uh, he that knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see, I've been made the righteousness of God in the person of Jesus Christ, and the devil goes to accuse me before the Heavenly Father about the present, and he looks and he says, Why, he's not everything you think he is, and he's not everything that he says he is, and he's not everything that he ought to be, and he draws the, the Father's attention to my presence, and so the Father looks at me, and all he sees is his son Jesus, 
and the righteousness of his son that has already satisfied his justice, that has already accomplished paying my sin debt and giving me a free and full pardon and forgiveness of my sin. We are blessed. We're blessed. If you were to think tonight out of this congregation of people that is sitting right here, and if it were possible to take each of our past before we were saved and put it up on a screen and let everybody see it, what a shocking statement it would make. If you were to take the past of the saved in this place tonight and put it on a screen, it'd be as quiet as the driven snow because that past has been taken away. When a person comes to Jesus and he is born again and born into the family of God, he is born without a past. And to accuse a Christian that has been born into the family of God would be like going over here to the nursery floor at Cobb General and pointing your finger at one of those little infants laying in there that is just a few hours old and say, hey, I want to talk to you about this kid's past. I want to tell you about his past. Well, he has no past. He's just been born. And I want to tell you when we as the children of God are born into the family of God, we're born without a past. We're blessed. And the only thing we have in the present is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I am blessed tonight. You are blessed tonight. We are blessed tonight with a pardon that cannot be discredited. Secondly, we are blessed tonight with a power that cannot be defeated. That power is greater than the devil himself. 1 John 4 and verse 4 said, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now I want to tell you, when we're defeated tonight as Christians, it is because that we are not appropriating the power that we have. Now I know I mentioned this the other Wednesday night, I believe, preaching, and I'm going to hit it again tonight because we Christians need to be reminded of what we have in the Lord. If we have all of this power, why don't we use it? Why don't we reckon it into our lives? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We have been blessed by a power that cannot be defeated. The Lord did not save us and leave us down here in this world to struggle through in our own weakness and our own frailty and go to heaven as defeated Christians. But I want to tell you, he imparted a power to you and I that is greater than the power of the devil himself. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. It is greater, a power greater than the devil. Let's see the extent of this power. We're in Ephesians chapter 1, look in verse number, uh, let, let's look in verse number 19. Paul is praying for the church at Ephesus to have the eyes of their understanding opened, that they might understand what is the hope of his calling and the riches of his glory and his inheritance in the saints. He is praying for them to get their eyes open and to see all this. And then he said in verse 19, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, and look at verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Now, in a couple of previous sermons, I have mentioned the first part of that verse. What is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward? And then I come along in another sermon just a week or so ago and I pointed out that that power was the same power that brought Jesus out of the grave in verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And I pointed out that that same resurrection power that brought Jesus out of the grave on the third day lives in you and I. But let's keep reading. This thing gets richer as we go. He says in verse 19, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come. 
Now that's what that power did that brought Jesus out of that grave on the third day. It set him positionally at the right hand of the Father in heavenly places. And it positioned him far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but in the world to come. That is what that resurrected power did for Jesus. That same power lives in you and I. And I want to ask you a question. In verse number 20, where is Jesus? What is his position? Verse 20 said that he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. That's where he's at, in heavenly places. We'll go down to chapter 2 for a moment. I'm telling you that, that we have been blessed with a power that cannot be defeated. Look in verse number 4. But God who is rich in mercy, he's just got through telling us about where we were at, dead in our trespasses and sin, and our conversation was according to the course of this world and so forth. And then he said in verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in, in sins, hath quickened us. He has made us alive together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up. What did, it, what did verse 19 say, or verse 20 say of chapter 1, speaking of Jesus? When he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, back in verse 6 of chapter 2, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where is Jesus seated at? He's seated in heavenly places. How high is that position? Well, verse 21 said it's far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named in this world and the world to come. Where are we at? We're up there with Jesus. We've been made to sit together with him. And how high are we seated with him? We're seated with him far above all principalities and powers and might and every name that is named in this world and in the world to come. I'm trying to tell you tonight, we've been blessed by a power that can never be defeated. We have the resurrection power of Jesus living in us that has raised us out of this world and seated us in heavenly places in Christ. Sometimes, sometimes we have a good meeting and you hear folks talk about the Lord's made us sit together in heavenly places and that's wonderful. I'm not going off on that. That's wonderful. The Lord does cause us to sit together in heavenly places sometimes when he comes down and he breathes on this place and he blesses us. But I want to tell you, if we ever get a hold of what he's telling us right here, we'll realize that's far better than anything we've ever tasted and anything that we've ever experienced to know that when he saved us, that power raised us up and that power lives on the inside of us. You say, well, preacher, why are people so defeated? Because they don't use the power. They don't utilize it. They don't appropriate it into their life. Why, well, it's like somebody having a million dollars in the bank and dying of starvation, malnutrition. And when, when you see a Christian going around in the mullet grubs and, you know, and he's talking about how defeated and how down he is and how the devil's beat him down and all that, you know what he's confessing? He's confessing that he's not using what God has given him. Because we have been blessed with a power that cannot be defeated. That power is greater than the devil. Greater than any principality and any power. That power is not only greater than the devil, but what is our worst enemy that we fear? Death. Do you know that that power that brought Jesus out of the grave on the third day that lives in us is greater than death itself? Greater than death itself. If you read and study the scripture, those Old Testament saints were held in the bondage of what? They were held in the bondage of death until Jesus defeated death. Hebrews, <clears throat> where's that at? Hebrews chapter, Hebrews chapter number 2. Hebrews chapter number 2 and verse number 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And look in, look in verse 15. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. 
What does that mean? Subject to bondage. Who through fear of death all their lifetime were subject to bondage. Well, if I'm subject to fall off this stage tonight, that means I could just do it any time. God forbid the thought, just an illustration that come to my mind. They were subject. They, they lived in fear of death all their lifetime who were subject to bondage. Subject to the bondage of what? Subject to the bondage of death. That Old Testament saint died. He was held in the bondage of death. But you know what Jesus did? When he went to the cross of Calvary and he defeated the devil, and he defeated the devil's power, and he came out of that grave on the third day and had the keys of death and hell, he delivered those Old Testament saints that were held in the bondage of death. And death no longer holds over our head the bondage of death. Why, death comes along when I draw my last breath and death said, we got old Berman now. Whoops, where's he at? Thought I had him. Where'd he go? About that time, I'm rejoicing in the presence of the Lord because Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I'm telling you, the power that we have in us, the split second we draw our last breath down here, we'll be transformed into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ because the power that lives in us is greater than the devil and it is greater than death itself. That's why Paul said, death, where's your sting? Grave, where's your victory? They said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Well, he, he tells us that we're blessed. We're blessed with a pardon that cannot be discredited. We're blessed with a power that cannot be defeated, a power greater than the devil, greater than death. In the third place, we're blessed with a peace that cannot be described. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 7 talks about, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God that passeth all understanding. Now, if I could understand this peace, I could describe it to you. But the peace of God passeth all understanding. You try to hem that up and describe that peace that passeth all understanding. I can't describe that. He said the peace of God that passeth all understanding. We have, we have been blessed tonight with a peace that cannot be described. You cannot describe it. I see a person, it looks like they ought to be falling apart. Their life is full of trials and troubles, and yet they're resting in that peace that passeth all understanding. The world, the world can't understand that, and, and we cannot get a hold of that because it is a peace that passeth all understanding. This peace that we've been blessed with is good enough for us to live by. Jesus said, my peace I leave with you. In John 14, I believe John 14, verse 27, he said, My peace I leave with you, not as the world giveth, give I unto thee. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You remember, I've explained and given definition before of the peace of God. The peace of God is simply the possession of adequate resources. Jesus said, The peace I'm going to give you is going to give you a peace that you don't have to let your heart be troubled and you don't have to let it be afraid. Because you have adequate resources. This peace that passeth all understanding that cannot be described that we've been blessed by is good enough to live by. But wait a minute. It's also good enough to leave by. Not live, but leave by. I was reading over there, Paul in Philippians, he said, I'm in a strait betwixt two. In Philippians chapter 1, he said, I'm in a strait betwixt two. He said, having a desire to depart, which is far better. But he went on to say, it's more needful that I stay here with you. Now think about what he's saying. He's talking about dying, folks. He's talking about going to heaven. He said, I'm in a strait between two. It's like, he, it's like he's saying, here I am. I, I'm, I'm straddling the fence, and I'm up on the fence post, and I don't know which side to jump off. Over here on one side is life, and over here on the other side is death. And he said, I'm trying to make up my mind which side I want to land on. He said, I know which side I want to land on. He said, uh, I want to go on to be with the Lord. said, that's far better than what I see on the other side of this fence. <laughs> hey, that's peace when you can leave here with peace. Some of the most vivid memories and some of the most blessed times that I've had as a pastor over these years of pastoring is be standing by the bedside of the hospital or home of a dear old saint of God that has served God and known the Lord and walked and talked with God to see them leave with that peace that passeth all understanding. I mean, the peace, the peace of God that passeth all understanding. I've seen some that just shouted their way right out of this world, right into the presence of God. 
just laughed in the devil's face and left on out. <laughs> Peace to leave by. Paul said, I'm now ready to be offered the time of my departure. Now, that word departure means to lift anchor and to set sail. He said, the time, it's time for me to lift anchor and set sail. But he said, I'm ready. That same peace for leaving was found in the heart of a man named Stephen when they picked up stones and stoned him till the last breath went out of his body. But when he left here, his face was lit up like an angel, the Bible said. He said, behold, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. What is that, preacher? That's peace that we've been blessed with, not only to live by while we're here, but to leave by when it gets ready. When it gets time for us to leave here, he blesses us with a peace that passes all understanding that is sufficient for us to leave by. I don't want to die. I enjoy living. I'm not looking forward. Now, I'm looking for the Lord to come, but I'm not just somehow or another, I'm just not looking forward to death. But you've heard me say this before, and I'll say it again. I believe because I'm saved, and I'm a child of God, I don't think I'm going to wring my hands and I don't think I'm going to worry about it when death moves in on me. But because of who I am in Jesus Christ, I believe he's going to give me sufficient grace and give me a peace that passeth all understanding. That I can stick my tongue out at the devil on my way out and leave here with the peace of God in my heart. I believe it was D.L. Moody. His last words when he died, he made this statement. He said his last words before he died... Some witnessed, and he said, Earth is receding, and heaven is advancing. Earth is receding, and heaven is advancing. I want to tell you, when God sends that angel band to pick up one of his saints and usher them in to the presence of Jesus Christ, I believe they can do so with a peace of God that passeth all understanding. We're blessed with a pardon that cannot be discredited. We're blessed with a power that cannot be defeated. We're blessed the peace that cannot be described. We're blessed with provisions that cannot be depleted. Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory. Two things that stand out in that verse about the provisions of God. It mentions, first of all, their size. He said, My God shall supply all your need according to his what? His riches in glory. Do you know that when God sets out to supply your need, he has all the riches in glory? To do it with, I think most. I think that's enough. To, I think that's enough to get most of us through, don't you? All of His riches in glory. My God, according to His riches in glory, by Christ Jesus, He mentions the size of them. All the riches in glory is what He provides for us from. But the blessing of that is those. Those provisions are never diminished. My mind went to something I had out of another sermon. I finally found it. I scratched around over there this afternoon looking for these figures for, for 20 minutes until I finally found it. I uh, couldn't remember when I preached it, but I knew I preached it somewhere. I kept looking through all them notebooks and everything trying to find it. But I remembered preaching this one time here about how the Lord provided for Israel when they were in the wilderness. And I wrote these figures down that a British uh, army officer figured out. When the children of Israel was in the wilderness, when God delivered them out of Egyptian bondage, there were at least two million plus that came out of that Egyptian bondage that God sustained through that wilderness. In fact, most people believe it's closer to three million than two, but just to be on the this British officer on be on the conservative side, he figured it at two million. And here's what he said. He said if there were two million Jews that spent forty years in that wilderness, and he said if each one of them were rationed and given one pound of food per day for each person, it would take nine hundred tons of food per day to feed them. And God did that for 40 years. Can you imagine that? In the middle of that wilderness, 2 million Jews, and if each one of them only had a pound a day, that is 900 tons of food per day. And they never went hungry a day. God fed them every day for 40 years in that wilderness. Wait a minute. They not only had to have food, but they had to have water. 
And this fella figured it up. If there were two million Jews and each one of them was given one gallon of water per person per day. Now we're talking about the drink. We're talking about the bathe. We're talking about if they were given one gallon of water per day. I don't think God's budget was that tight myself, but this army officer just figured if it was one gallon per person per day, it would take 29 wells pumping 6,000 gallons of water per hour every day just to give them a gallon each. God did that every day for 40 years. And you know what the blessing of all that is? He was none the poorer at the end of that 40 years than he was in the first day when he started. And what was he doing? He was providing them according to his riches and glory. That's what you and I have at our disposal. We are blessed tonight. I don't want the world to go around feeling sorry for me saying, poor old Christian, poor old Brother Berman. You know, he's just crazy about Jesus and, and all this serving the Lord and this religious stuff, and he's just missing out on so much the world has to offer. Folks, we are blessed. We are blessed. The size, the source of them, he said, by Christ Jesus. Let me mention this, and I'm going to close. There's a fifth thing I want to mention tonight, and that is that we have been blessed with a prospect that cannot be diminished. How bright, I, I don't know about you, but I'm going to tell you something. If all I had for my prospects were what this world had to offer me, I'm going to tell you, you're in trouble tonight with your face in the government. We're in a mess. Amen? We're in trouble. Somebody told me this morning that, that there's two people in this world that, that is on the popularity polls. They're at all-time lows, and that's preachers and politicians. Anytime preachers and politicians are mentioned, men grab their pocketbook and their wives. That's what this fellow told me. <laughs> That's so funny, I want to cry about it. <laughs> We're in trouble. This world is getting darker every day. I, I never have thought too much about putting a gun to my head, but I want to tell you if, and you can call this disrespectful or just say what you want to, but I'm about like the rest of you, and I just have a little advantage because I'm the preacher and in the pulpit, but I'm about like the rest of you. I've had it about up to here with some of these politicians. But if I thought all the prospect that we had was anchored in the White House, I'd almost be tempted to just get it over with now. Because we are in a sad shape. We're in trouble in this country tonight. But I want to tell you something. Blessed be God. God is still in control. And he is still going to have the last and final word. And Jesus said, just look up and lift up your head. Because your redemption draweth nigh. The darker it gets down here for this old world, the brighter our prospects are. And we're the only one that can say that. What about these poor folks that all the hope they have is in the White House and in these politicians that run this country? Now, I love America, and I don't even like to say things like I'm saying now. I love America. I'd rather live here than anywhere else. I'm proud of the American flag, but I pray, God, we have a revival in this place. It'll shake us up for election time. There, I mean, we're at the place now. You talk about Democrats and Republicans. Republicans? be proud of being either one anymore. I sure would like to see somebody run for office that loved God. Or you say, preacher, can't mix religion and, and the government and all that. And I tell you, I read in this book, and, and the Lord didn't 
There wasn't many in there, but there was a few in there that ruled the country and loved God at the same time. And, and they fared much better than what we're doing. Every time they had a godly king that sat on the throne in Israel that loved God and led the people to serve God and recognize him, God poured his blessings out upon them. And I believe God would do the same for America tonight. If we had somebody that recognized God instead of trying to just push him completely out of everything. We have our prospects tonight. They're never going to... I don't know what the outcome is going to be. When's the, when, when is the election? November the 5th? Well, I'm going to tell you something. No matter who ends up getting elected to lead this country, our prospects are going to be just as bright on November the 6th as they are on November the 4th or the 5th because our hope is not in this world. But it's in another world. I believe we ought to do the best we can to honor God and serve Him while we're here. But I don't want to get adjusted to this old world because this old world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Just passing through. I'm not going to sit down and feel sorry for myself and I'm not going to sit down and worry about the outcome of the country. The God who has taken care of us and provided for us thus far is going to see us the rest of the way home. Our prospects are not going to be diminished. We are blessed with prospects that is not going to be diminished. That hope we have is looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I will tell you, we get accused sometimes preaching about the second coming, and we get accused sometimes of loving our disappearing more than his appearing. But I want to tell you, the further we go and the further this world goes and the mess it's in, I'm not sure that all of us are not going to be loving our disappearing before it's over with. Amen? If all we had to look forward to was down here, we were in for some dark days. But praise God, our future is just as bright as the promises of God. And he has given us the promise of his word. He's coming one of these days. He promised us to come the first time, and he did. And he promised us to come the second time, and he's going to. Amen. Whatever heads bow and everybody right close. We are blessed. We are blessed. Father, take the message tonight. I pray you'll use it to your own honor and to your own glory. And may the people that are gathered in this place tonight have found, Lord, a source of encouragement and blessing from the word of God tonight to be reminded of how that we're blessed. Lord, help us not to sit down in this old sinful world in which we're living in, wall around in self-pity, feel sorry for ourselves, but help us, Lord, to, to lift our head up and to realize and recognize who we are and how we've been blessed and to give this world a demonstration of what it means to know Jesus in the free pardon of sin. Bless in this invitation. Lord, I don't know how to give an invitation, but Lord, you do. The Holy Spirit knows. And I pray the Holy Spirit of God would just move in in this service tonight, in this invitation, and do what needs to be done in each of our hearts, and then help people to obey you. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen.